do Texas history here for the first part. Um, little background. And here's where we kind of look where things kind of come in together and what happened history. 1823, Mexico breaks away from Spain. 1823, we issue the Monroe Doctrine. Do you think they have anything to do with each other? Why are we telling France and Britain to not come over to North America and interfere? So we can have a land for ourselves. Well, if you want to look at it that way with the Manifest Destiny, yeah. But we actually weren't even thinking in that range. We were saying that for, as Mexico's breaking away down in South America, we have Simon Bolivar that is going and having uprisings and smaller countries starting to appear down in South, in South America. Um, and instead of France and Britain going and taking over them, we're going to have them. Which, we may not have been thinking so much to take over them, but... Do we think that we're more powerful than they are? If we can control them in a certain way? No. So we have our own reasons for doing this. Um, Texas was a part in North Mexico, very sparsely populated, and Stephen Austin went to the Mexican government and asked if some Americans could move in. Again, you should remember the name Stephen Austin, but Texas is pretty easy. And so he goes to Mexico, and Mexico, the Mexican government gives him a allow. But there's three things that the Americans must do in order to go. First thing you must do is you got to give an oath. If you go to another country, like if you come to America and get a green card, are you going to have to give an oath that you're going to obey the laws of that country? So that's nothing unusual. Okay, you know, raise your right hand and say, okay, I promise to obey the laws of Mexico. Mr. Mass? Yes? Do you have Sarah Stanley in class? No, she's not here today. Thank you. Uh, second thing is, they were to convert to Catholicism. Most Americans were Protestant at that time. And Mexico, the, uh, from the Spanish heritage, they were Catholic. So Stephen also said, yeah, that's not a problem. We can go from being Baptist, Methodist. We can go and be Catholic. All right? Not, not that different. And the third thing is, they were not allowed to have slaves. See, in 1823, Mexico had outlawed slavery. In the United States, we were nowhere close to it at this time. Most of the places of industrial, well, today what we call industrialized countries of the world, had outlawed slavery, but not the United States. So we were the most advanced country in our own mind, but were we really that advanced uh, there? But that's what it said, you can't move to it. As the Americans moved to Texas, did they obey these rules? Yes. Yes. Well, and this is what I kind of, kind of get to. We will have count some come and then more and more. Now, a lot of what you think of Texas is not the area they're moving to. Most of you think of Texas as this real dry area, and that would be the western part. Where they're moving to would kind of be in between where Dallas, Austin, um, Houston, the southeast section of it, which is very hot and humid, but very good for growing cotton and very good for agriculture. And that's the area that they are moving to. The Americans that came, they gave their oath. And when they came there, did they convert to Catholicism? No. no. <clears throat> and even though they weren't supposed to bring their slaves, did they bring their slaves? Yes. Yeah. Now, how do you think the Mexicans like that? Not at all. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to move to our country, obey our laws. Um, now, I have this other question. Why did Mexico even allow Americans to come? They had to pay them. more people. All right, they needed people. But why, why are Americans good? That What are Americans good at that the Mexicans needed to take so care of in Texas? What? Indians? Yeah. See, the Indian tribes that were living in Texas, all right, with some Comanche, Apache, and other, other tribes, they were some of the most fierce tribes and some of the hardest ones to get rid of. Well, what other group of people is good at killing Indians than the Americans? And it wasn't just that, but that actually was part of the reason why. Because a lot of people from Mexico were did not want to move up into North Mexico because of the, the Indian problems that, that they would have. Uh, there. The other thing is they wanted it to develop it. If the Americans came in and developed it, that's they were they they assumed that it would be like if someone moves to the United States, 
that they would end up becoming a citizen of Mexico. And that would contribute to their economy and help them out. Uh, the problem that we have is, though, as the Americans kept moving there, we didn't think of ourselves as Mexicans, or Tejanos even. And if you see, by 1830, they, they outnumbered the native, the native Mexicans that lived there three to one. Five years later, it is nine to one. The Americans keep coming. Um, Mexico made rules saying no more Americans are allowed to move here. I know this might sound weird, but we then have the Americans sneaking across the border to go into <laughs> Texas, Mexico. That is owned by Mexico. Uh, we were not obeying their rules, and the Americans kept coming and kept coming. Um, and eventually, when there were so many more Americans there, they started talking about, well, why should we be part of Mexico? Why don't we just be part of the United States? And actually, a lot of the Tianos that were already living there that were Mex Mexican, they actually agreed, a lot of them agreed with the Americans because... Whenever you're on the outskirts of everything, you always feel like you're ignored. So for a couple of decades, they always felt like, well, Mexico City's not taking care of us anyways. All right? and so we might as well go ahead and join with them. So we have a group of Americans led by Sam Houston. Easy name to remember with Texas. Sam Houston that started talking about. The leader of Mexico is Santa Ana. He does not like this idea, and he decides, I'm going to crush this. So he gets together an army and cut to go up to Texas to put down this rebellion. One of the problems that he has is his army was not exactly your best and brightest soldiers. Um, basically took a whole bunch of young men, put uniforms on them, handed them guns, didn't do much training with them, and marched them northward to Texas. So even though he had an army of over 4,000 soldiers, it's not a real substantial army uh, that he had. If it would have been truly trained soldiers, he, uh, they would have been able to put this rebellion down pretty quickly. But it wasn't that. Now, we get to the most famous place in Texas when it comes to rebellion, the Alamo. A couple of different people that you need to know with this. The first guy is William Travis. Uh, Travis is a, a former American who he has had a couple different family problems. He's actually had a pretty hard life and he's gone and he moved to Texas and he actually married in with, and I'm not sure exactly how, but he actually married in with, with one of the richer uh, Mexican families, and, but he doesn't really get along with his father-in-law. So there's some personal things in there, but he is one of the leaders that we have. We then have another guy by the name of James Bowie. Anybody know what Bowie is famous for in the Bowie frontier? Knife. Yeah, the Bowie knife. I think on the next slide I have a picture of it. But he is he he makes this knife and it kind of is a longer knife, has a curved edge, has a handle, but for a lot of our frontiersmen and Americans, they just they know the he's knife. the one that made the the knife. Okay, I mean it's um, and invented it. Yeah. William Travis is an American leader? Yeah, these are all American, well, they're Texan leaders. This is where I'm sorry if I'm doing it. These are all, they're American background, but they are Texans. So they're from America. Yeah. So they're American. Yeah, but they're, they're trying to make Texas, they're the ones that are saying, let's get away from Mexico. All right. We have a group of guys from Tennessee that volunteer to come help Texas fight. What is the University of Tennessee's mascot? The volunteers. The volunteers. And that's where the name comes from. Why isn't that hideous creep? Is it called that? Well, anything <laughs> it's orange is gray. It's really, when you, especially if you put blue with the with it. Yeah. I mean, Why? that's Why? where Why I mean, it's color. Said, you put blue and the orange together, you ought to just be that's basically holding a road sign to make sure that for traffic to slow down the construction. Yeah. All right. And then those that are a little higher intelligence will actually work on the road. So. But, <laughs> but for our Tennessee volunteers, Okay, and the name that that's where the name comes from. Um, that is where they, they had heard about these people from Texas. Davy Crockett um, is where part of the story of him comes about. I just had a question. You said Tennessee Volunteers is a mascot of Tennessee. Yeah. How do you make a mascot of a volunteer? 
that he's a dog. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Actually, there you go. It's like a frontier. They have they have basically like a like a baby croc type guy that, and a frontier man, and then they use a dog. Okay, so they have a, they have like a hound dog. Um, so, all right. Davy Crockett, who earlier in his life he had become famous, had been elected as the Coonskin Congressman. He goes off to Washington D.C. and when he goes to Washington D.C., um, he's one that he's got people that really love them. I hate to use this analogy, but in some ways, Davy Crockett was like the Sarah Palin of his day. There were people that really loved them. Oh, as a down-to-earth type of person, we need this type of person. Meanwhile, you got other people with Davy Crockett saying, "This guy's an idiot." Okay, I mean, realistically, that is what happened to Davy Crockett. Um, he gets to Washington, D.C., and other congressmen are just totally ignoring him when he first gets there. And he ends up using his fame from where he wrote all these stories about himself and trying to get more famous. And he actually started wearing a coonskin cap. He didn't in the beginning. He dressed normal, but then he decided, hey, I'm going to play the role. And kind of like Sarah Palin. Sarah Palin sometimes will go, and even though she may not actually have this, she'll be able to say some folksy type thing because that's what people expect from her. And they, they love that. And that's what the people that supported Davy Crockett, they loved it. The um, only problem was is even though he got some following from people throughout the nation, when Davy Crockett went back to Tennessee and ran for re-election, he lost. His own neighbors didn't want him anymore. Aww. And kind of put it in a, in a roundabout fashion, Davy Crockett went through his midlife crisis. What to do now? Okay, you're you were famous. You kind of gone past that, all right. And then this stuff with Texas kind of occurs. So he and some other people from Tennessee, they go to Texas to help them fight. Um, actually, before we get to that, now the whole story with the Alamo. There is a whole lot more story than there is um, sometimes with what is actually true. But it was a 12-day siege. Santa Ana came down with his army, over 4,000 soldiers, and surrounded what used to be an old Spanish mission. It was not a true fort. They built a little wall around some parts of it. They had some cannons that, there, but it was not a true fort. And there was, if I'm getting the number right, 187 uh, men that were then inside this church in the, in the surrounding courtyard. So you have less than 200 people surrounded by over 4,000 people. <laughs> How long does it take Santa Ana to then capture? Why was it 12 days then? Yeah, that's what I was saying, 12 days. Why would it take 12 days? Americans are they fight back. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're not good for all. And it's where I told you that Santa Ana, his army, was not a very well trained group. And part of his plan wasn't real good. They, yeah, they're surrounded out there, and then they would decide, well, let's go and try to attack the North Wall. So they come charging towards the North Wall, and basically all the people in the Alamo go, and they start firing, and they drive them back to Nato. So tomorrow, let's go to the South Wall. Try that one. Maybe that one's weaker. So they come in that direction. Right. Here's what what would be some of your plan to do? All the the west wall. Oh, yeah, come in different directions where they just can't concentrate on one side. Yeah, they do have the advantage that they're hiding behind, even though it's not even the true wall, but they have that. And it, said it took 12 days. They finally capture them. And here, again, this is where some we get to where stories and truth we never know. Um, stories said with Davy Crockett comes that he has, I think his, the, the name of his gun was Old Betsy, if I'm remembering the right name, and that, and that he is fighting them. But stories that we got from, from not only some Mexican uh, writers there later on, but we've also found out from some of the women that were not killed, because some of the women and children that were inside the walls were not killed. But we found out from some of them that he was actually maybe hiding in a closet. And I think I told you all before that in the Disney version, they try to mix mix the things together. So as he's killing them and he's fighting, he goes, he's knocked into a closet, and that's where he's killed. So they kind of mix a little bit of the story with the old Disney movie. Uh, the John Wayne movie is actually a pretty good one also. Not real good for history, but for a good story and an old fun movie. But this is where the Alamo, and we're going to get Remember the Alamo. Because those 12 days were actually really important. Because as the army is there at the Alamo, and actually I can't remember the exact number, but I think that even though they lost, if I remember right, 187 soldiers for the Alamo, Santa Ana lost like almost 1,500. So, mostly he lost about a third of his army. 
and lost 12 days. And during that 12 days, Sam Houston's getting a bigger and bigger army. And we're talking, we're not talking, they may not be training like a regular army, but we're talking about frontiersmen. We're talking about rough and tumble type people. And we're talking about fighters here. Uh, not going and finding vagrants on the streets of Mexico City and say, here, here's a uniform and a gun, you're coming with me. Uh, this one is not nearly as famous, but the same sort of thing would happen soon after that at Goliad. Uh, a lot smaller version. It was, I mean, I think it was less than, than 50 of the Texans, but Santana would surround it, take him a little while, he would capture it and wipe out everybody that was living there. But what happened was the slogan, remember the Alamo, remember the Goliad. Uh, for you all, you need to remember the Goliad too. Because everybody remembers the Alia, the Alamo. But here's where there was more than just that. Uh, we would then have the biggest battle, which was realistically the only real battle that we would have. On the shore, basically, on, or next to the San, the San Jacinto River, Sam Houston, who took the tactic that George Washington had. As Santa Ana came towards him, Sam Houston would retreat and retreat and retreat. So Santa Ana made a camp, and he basically went and had his back to the river, and then Sam Houston came in and did a surprise attack. And even though he had um, a lot smaller army, I think he had only around 500 soldiers or so, he was able to defeat Santa Ana's army. Here's where different stories come through that Santa Ana tried to escape um, and then there's different stories that he was hiding in a tree, dressed up in women's clothes, clothing. Um, the, the most truth that I have kind of seen is that what he ended up doing was kind of wearing, like when he was trying to sneak through the night, he was wearing like a, a woman's shawl trying to sneak through. But, you know, for some cartoons and all that. But Sam Houston, they cap when they captured Santa Ana, they made him sign a treaty saying that Texas was his own country. All right, here's where we have some everything. You see, here's where the, for where the Battle of San Jacinto was. They kind of trapped San, um, Santa Ana and the army. They did a surprise attack in there, and where they could not get out with the river and it was too deep for the background. And you, if you're an army, you do not want to back up. Thanks for a nice camp for our campsite, but not for your army. Um, here's a picture of a Bowie knife, and you notice like it had a curve there. It almost it was good not only for, for when you're cleaning animals, making it that way, it was like a skinny knife on the back end of uh, there. Um, and I'm not sure if this is, I think this is at the battle. No, this is for the Big B of the Alamo, I believe. And you see where, I think that's supposed to be Baby Crockett. Yeah, Tim. Well, what's the name of the tree? The what? Of the tree that tree is in Santa Ana? I don't even know. It's just basically they signed saying that they are independent. And once they are independent, they make their own country. The Republic of Texas, but is also known as the Lone Star Republic. They elect a president, who was their first and only president, Sam Houston. As soon as they become president, or as soon as they become a country, they then apply for a mission into the United States. They get, this is no problem, the U.S. wants us. And at that time, we have President Jackson. Jackson says, yeah, let's not look at this right now. And he's a powerful enough president when he tells Congress not to do something, they don't do it. Let's pass it on to the next guy. And what does Van Buren say? No. No, let, let's, let's not do this right now. Why not? Slavery. Yeah, the issue of slavery. Now, there was a little bit in it because Mexico had warned the United States that if you do accept Texas in, you're going to have to fight us. Now, do you think that really scared off Andrew Jackson? Mm -hmm. In fact, for Andrew Jackson, I can almost see Andrew Jackson thinking, I think really <sighs> if there was, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I just want to do is go fight Mexico. <laughs> All right, I'll even get on my own. I'll take the army and lead them there. But Andrew Jackson was, again, a smart enough politician that he says, we're not going to make this issue because when Texas comes in, that issue of slavery that at that time was kind of brewing under the surface, all right. He knew that it would be, um, and it's not that Andrew, Andrew Jackson, we're talking about a slave owner, and I've kind of said before, one of our most racist presidents that we ever had. It's not that he didn't want slavery to expand. Okay, it's not that bad. He just looked at it and said, this could be too much of a problem. For his own reasons, Andrew Jackson would have said, let's get Texas, expand the southern states, the western part that he 
that he supported, and hey, while we're at it, let's go ahead and get a couple blows in on Mexico. <laughs> but he knew enough of what was happening. All right, the election of 1844. I know we had it in uh, the other section of notes, but we have our two candidates, Henry Clay, who we know loses, and then James K. Polk, who is a dark horse candidate, which means that not a whole lot of people knew of him. So Henry Clay only ran for president once? No, he ran like three, four times. Oh, but he never won. This is one, no, he never won. <laughs> oh, all right. Yeah, his, it depends on how you want to look at things. And, and, uh, he, whether he was the major candidate of one of four candidates or five candidates at one, one that time, and there you can kind of look at But yeah, he ran multiple times. Um, notice in here also James Bernie, Liberty Party. Remember what the Liberty Party was for? Freedom. Uh, the abolition, freedom of the, of the slaves. Um, and that's where their issue was. The, the Democrats had a hard time trying to pick out their candidate. The Whigs, it wasn't so hard. They had Clay. But the Democrats were having a hard time. And each person they went through, they were saying, no, not him, not Buchanan, not, not Lewis Cass. And finally they got to James K. Polk. And Polk said, if I'm president, I am going to go, we're going to let Texas in. We're going to take care of this whole thing with Oregon. And he stated, this is what I'm going to do as I'm president. And what's amazing with him is he did it. Some people will look and say that James K. Polk was one of our greatest presidents. There's a, easily could do a thesis statement and say that and support it, that he was our greatest one-term president. He said he would have served only one term. He served one term. He did not run for re-election in 1848. He would have had no problem winning at that time. Why? 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 Because he said he was only going to run one term. He said, I'm going to do this, 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 and this. If I can't get it done in one term, I don't need to be there a second time. And he accomplished everything. So, um, James K. Polk was also a major workaholic. He died very soon after he left the office, and a lot of people, when they look at things, said he probably worked himself to death. Okay, uh, and, but this is where it happened. And I don't have time today, but tomorrow, all right, for some of you, if I am here like I'm expecting to be, then we will have we are Mr. Neruda, James K. Polk. I have a song, and you'll get to hear Mr. Neruda sing. So. All right, so that's the end. What was the party? What was the movie party you Even Mikey was like protecting it for you. Okay, for the Mexican War, for those of you that are major into military history, uh, it's actually there are some very interesting things with it. But this is one time when having things for AP. Notice on some wars, I most wars don't go nearly as in depth as I would like to. Um, and what's really ironic is, if you were to look at it for the test, the, the most likely thing that you ever will have on the, for an AP exam, as well as your Florida in the course of the exam, will actually be, for the Mexican War, the will not proviso. Um, and, it, and what is kind of odd with this is this was a bill that never even passed. But what the proviso was, is after we had declared war on, Mexi on the Mexican War, it said that if we gain any lands, we were forbidden to have slavery on those lands. Again, it never passed, but this kind of shows that change over time. Because when we get to what is actually probably the one, one of the most important things and the impacts of the Mexican War is, after the Mexican War, no matter what the issue is, slavery is involved in it. Okay, and this is where we, and this is kind of symbolic of this, is even the, with the fighting of it. Um, but they said it did not pass, but then it said almost everything issue that you would have, somehow or another, the issue of slavery, and we would have this splitting with the United States between the North and the South. Uh, there it is, Balica. Uh, okay, that's not the only thing with the Mexican War, but kind of to go, well, what is the most important thing first? All right, the beginnings of the war. Remember when Polk for 1844 election, he had it where his number one thing was expansion. One of his one of his goals that he said was he was going to annex Texas and make it part of the United States. Jackson had avoided it. Van Buren had had avoided it. Tyler wanted to do it, but nobody listened to Tyler, so it didn't matter. And Polk was elected. Tyler was finally able to push it through because. Really, I mean, and so officially, Tyler is the person that gets Texas in the United States. Uh, but it was Polk's event. Now, here's where the question comes. 
What is the border of Texas and Mexico then? And I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce this right. Uh, the Nulces River uh, there or the Rio Grande. We said it was the southernmost. Mexico said it was the northernmost. So what we're doing is fighting over this area in between, or that's the area of Texas. When we allow Texas into the, the United States, we send our army down right on the border of this river. Mexico puts it on that river. Because um, again, this is kind of no man's land, both, both sides claim it. Uh, Mexico said if we, if we let Texas in, they're fighting us. So we're getting ready in case they do fight us. Um, but but there, for, a lot, for a little while, there was a little pause before anything happened. But then we had some of our patrols meet some of their patrols, and we had it where shots were fired. It's kind of like at Lexington. We don't know who fired. It doesn't matter. They're shooting at each other. But American blood was spilled, which comes up then with the bloody spot resolution. Because that message gets back to Washington, D.C. that yes, Mexico has fired upon our soldiers. We have American soldiers that have, that have spilled blood. And we have this young Whig congressman from Illinois, first term, this recently elected, and he says, before, we, before I'll ever declare war, I want to see that spot where the blood was spilled. Which, yeah, I mean, it's kind of symbolic with things, but they're in Washington, D.C. How long will it take him to get on, basically, a lot of that on horseback and get to the border of Texas and Mexico? See that spot, go back then to Washington, D.C., and vote on this resolution. Two months. Uh, two months if it's fast horses and not a lot of other things. Does that make any sense? You say that again? As a young Whig congressman from Illinois. Sound pretty crazy? And with this young Whig congressman, it was kind of odd because most people said, all right, this, that's kind of ridiculous. Um, he went back, when he went back for re-election, he lost his re-election bid. And for the most part, wasn't heard of him for quite a long time as he went on, became a failed shopkeeper uh, along the way. Um, was a little lawyer, okay? A lot of people said he had some psychological problems uh, there. So, yeah. And the bloody spot, was that between the Rio Grande and the Nuces River? Yes. That's where, that's where the, the shooting took place, was right there. Has anyone figured out who this silly Grande? young Whig congressman is? Here's a picture of him. John Tyler. <laughs> he would look better on later on in his life when, when he... Um, because he's not really the most attractive man, and one thing that he's usually known for a little bit more is after a young girl wrote to him and said that he would look better with a beard. Yeah, Abraham Lincoln. But he is the one that issues the bloody spot resolution. Uh, so you kind of see here two of our greatest presidents. You remember Washington steps upon in history and loses Fort Necessity. All right, Abraham Lincoln comes and basically is seen as something that is a little bit outlandish for what he's want, wanting in um, when it comes to the Mexican War. But that's where, I, and again, he, he kind of steps away and we won't hear from him for another 10 years. That was a wig. Yeah, he was a wig. Wait, you know when he was in office, he was a wig. No, he wasn't a wig when he became president. The wig party would die out. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see if you remember your bracketing days from the first week of school. In what year did the Republican Party come out? 1854. When is the end of the Mexican War? 1848. So we are before the Republican Party comes about. All right, more than Mexico. In between the Rio Grande and this River. Now, we declare war. Again, we have the Wilma Proviso, but it doesn't ever pass. We have two generals, and actually their fighting styles, a lot of this goes with their nicknames. And so, and then, you remember the people at this time period, they have nicknames. And one thing you have to realize, we did not have Hollywood stars, we did not have sports stars at that time. Our stars that the newspapers followed around were military guys, and we'll find this really in the Civil War. Okay, they are, I mean, they are, I mean, just really, again, stars, there's no other way to put it. Um, and so if you got a nickname, that's something that, that goes with you. 
The first guy who fought more in the northern section of North, North, North Mexico, which those of you that think of Mexico and you think of these dry, hilly type areas, not a whole lot of vegetation, that is what that area has. But that guy is Zachary Taylor, and he has the nickname of Old Rough and Ready, which was very appropriate for him because Zachary Taylor was the type of guy that when it came to leading the soldiers, he was in front. If he didn't say, okay, you guys go attack. All right, he jumped on his horse, pulled out his sword, and he's leading the attack and going right in the fight. Okay, old, rough, and ready. <laughs> Meanwhile, we then have Winfield Scott. Winfield Scott has to take on the coast, and this is an area that, well, some of you go that, maybe been in that area if you've ever been on a cruise or something like that. Mexico City's in the Central Valley. It's actually very well protected because there's mountain range, uh, ranges, I think what the Sierra Madre and Sierra, uh, I can't remember what the mountain, two mountain ranges are on both sides of, of, the, of the Mexico City. Um, so it gets very well protected militarily. There's only a few mountain passes to get there, so Mexico was able to take their army and stop at some of them there. Um, Vera Cruz was one of the major battles to break through, to get onto the coast and break through through one of those mountain passes. Uh, there and then eventually this general Winfield Scott would be the one that would then capture Mexico City. This one took a lot more strategy. This is not kind of going out and fighting, uh, fighting like the battles where I didn't tell the battles that Zachary Taylor won. But and you don't you don't need to know these battles all. It's not like having to know Saratoga and Yorktown. Uh, those of you that can remember these battles, then that's great. If you don't, it's not something to tell you. But he won Monterey and won the fist of the door. But Winfield Scott was on the coast. He is a very, very precise type of guy. He is one for planning. Hey, I mean, he's extremely organized, but the general that we needed for that case. He did not go jumping on his horse, which his horse would be very happy about because, well, let's just say he's a little bit on the OB side. Okay, so the horse would not want him galloping into the, to the center of a battle. Uh, Winfield Scott sat out on the coast on a ship a lot of times while the battle was taking place. Again, not that he isn't active, it's just he's commanding from there, he has officers going. But his nickname is Old Fuss and Feathers. That strikes fear in the opponent, doesn't it? Both of these generals, though, were extremely good. Again, they each and their own. Winfield Scott probably would not have been very good in North in, in North Mexico because that was one that you've got to be able to just be spontaneous and go. Zachary Taylor probably wouldn't have been very good down in the southern part because this took a lot of planning and basically precise movements, almost like a chess match. They move their soldiers here, they move, you go there. Uh, but that's where our two major generals are. You see Winfield Scott, okay, later on he would get a little bit bigger. Uh, he's going to come back also and later on in the section because he'll be important in the Civil War. Not actually leading battles, but, but in all reality, he is going to make the plan that ultimately would win the Civil War for the North. But, yeah, but it's, and that is, I think, in between Mexican War and Civil War. Alright, some other things to know. Alright, Stephen Kearney. Just, and this, here's some names you need to be familiar with. Kearney would fight in what today we call with New Mexico, Arizona, uh, what ultimately would be the Mexican Session. Not a whole lot of fighting that took place there, and basically had a small group of soldiers that helped capture that area, but it gave us some reason to claim that we should have it. John C. Fremont, he is known as the Pathfinder. Now, he's going to also come back in history. Did we have him with some people? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, and he's later on it's going to be history because he's going to be the first Republican to ever run for a president in 1856. And that, but he gets famous again, the, the public figures that the generals are, because well, he just happened to be out in California, and he and some of his fellow soldiers happened to be there. And there were some Americans that had moved to Northern California, and he helped convince those Americans as well as some of the Mexicans there, for California to break away and form their own country. And they do, they form their country and name it the Bear Flag Republic, 
which even today the, for California, I mean, you have with the, the bear involved with it. But don't ask me what it is with these, with our states when they became their own countries, they had Lone Star Republic, Bear Flag Republic, but that was just what they called it. But California was its own country for a short period of time also. The war would end with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Now, we as Americans can say we have never stolen any land from anybody. We have always got it in a legal fashion. We did not steal this Mexican session, okay, and get, be familiar with that, not Texas, because Texas broke away on their own. See, we didn't take Texas. They broke away on their own. Even though California broke away, we knew there was a little bit of shady deal with that. But what we ended up doing is in the treaty, we would pay Mexico $15 million for the Mexican session. So did we take it from them? No, no we paid them. Sometimes it was Louisiana. Yes. It's a big chunk of land. Uh, now, did we ever send any gold to Mexico? Not really. So did we actually pay for it? Yeah, we did pay for it. I want some paper money. Sort of. You're you're sort. Of. The Mexican government owed around fifteen million dollars to different American businesses. So what we did is we said, okay, well, to put in modern modern time, let's say that Mexico owed Grumman aircraft, they owed them five million dollars. Well, instead of Mexico, us giving the money to Mexico and then telling them you got to pay Grumman, we said, well, here, we'll pay your debt to this American company. So we paid $15 million on, officially on the books. Yes, we did. But we actually paid most of that money back to American companies and American businesses. But we forgave them the debt. But if you do accounting, we officially did pay for it. Um, and we did not take the land from Mexico officially. That was to get California? Well, the Mexican session, which is some of Arizona, New Mexico, you call California, Nevada. Basically the southwest United States. All right, here's some of, here's some of the important little things. This is where, what's well, actually, besides the Wilmot Proviso, the other important thing to remember with, with the effects of the war. Going back, for everything from this point on, slavery is the number one issue. And some of, what, some of you in your reflection questions, this is one thing, and I probably wrote on most of you if you didn't have it for the one about Manifest Destiny. I didn't take off if you didn't have it. But one of the things for Manifest Destiny of what it brought up was with conflicts was not just against other countries as we want to expand, but even within our own country, the sectionalism and that whole slavery issue. Well, now it really comes to a head uh, with at the end of the war. The other thing it did is it trained soldiers. We're, our military, we hadn't fought since the War of 1812, didn't do real good in the War of 1812 overall. Now we actually get up and we train our military. We've had West Point, um, and we've had our soldiers that have been training at, at West Point. And there's a lot of things you can do when you have an army and play war games, but do you actually really learn how to do things until you actually fight? Yeah. And that is what happened. So we went, and these tactics that our generals had studied, our lower officers had studied, now they get to practice it for real and learn, hopefully not make mis too many mistakes. Um, I have on here Robert E. Lee's story because this is where you're getting recognized nice end. Now, usually most of the time when you see Robert E. Lee, it's he's a little bit younger at this time period. Um, before most of you think, when you think of Robert E. Lee as the white haired, white beard guy. Um, but during the Mexican War, he was one of Winfield Scott's most trusted junior officers. And there's actually part of what goes with him, it's a pretty neat story for him, is during some of the fighting for Vera Cruz, the parts of the army were separated from each other. And he went basically back and forth in it. While, as he was going down this one path, he had stopped, got a, drop, a little bit of water on, I don't know whether it was like a little spring or on the side of the stream or something. He heard some soldiers coming up speaking Spanish try to find a place to hide. There would have to be a log of a tree that had fallen down, jump behind it and kind of just scoot it as far as he could underneath basically that log. That group of soldiers came up, got a drink. Some of them sat down even on that log. 
Now, think about if you're out in the woods somewhere and what all is crawling around underneath basically a tree that's been falling for a little while. Right? Okay, you might have snakes, no, not to mention the bugs, all right, mosquitoes are biting. And that whole time there, Robert E. Lee, and, I'm not, and actually what had happened was for several hours, various groups came back and forth and back and forth um, there, and it was soldiers. Now, most regular soldiers don't know what the plans are. But when you stop and you see another group, hey, where are you heading? Hey, what are they doing? All right, these guys don't know what they're doing. They're getting paid the big bucks and they won't fight. We're doing all the fighting. And you hear the different ones talking and complaining about different things uh, there. But you get an idea of what's happening because more and more of them say, hey, I think we're heading to this direction. I, I, think, I think we're supposed to attack tomorrow night. Meanwhile, he is underneath this log. And, it, and there were times some were sitting on the log. If they would just turn around, they would see an American soldier sitting right under there. Now, Robert E. Lee was raised in Virginia. How did he learn Spanish? His wife sitting there. Uh, not sitting there. He didn't learn it then. He was a smart guy, but he didn't learn it that quick. The Indians? No. Not in Virginia. As a, remember Richard Henry Lee, one of the first families of Virginia? Okay, Robert E. Lee's his nephew. As a planter's son, you would have had tutors come in and into the plantation. Actually, his father had been bankrupt, so he was actually on one of his with his cousins and schooled there for private tutor. But some of the education that you got was Latin, Greek, okay, other foreign languages. Which, if you think of what is the base of Spanish, comes from especially Latin. And so when he went, he actually when he got to to, to Mexico to fight him, he was studying the language. It was really easy for him to learn it because he already knew several other languages um, there and using that. So he didn't understand everything in Spanish, but for the most part, by that time, he did. Um, it actually helped Winfield Scott to win battles because it was almost as if he was a spy, even though it wasn't on purpose for that case there. Uh, but Winfield Scott, after the war, had praised Robert E. Lee and had said he was one of the brightest minds the U.S. Army had. Meanwhile, there's this another guy that Winfield Scott kind of criticized for, for being a slob. And he's going to come up in history later on also. He's a good fighter, but a slob. Grant. Yeah. Ulysses S. Grant. So we're training what would be then the two biggest generals in the Civil War. We're training them how to fight in the Mexican War. I know that's a long story for one little thing for an effect, but that's where you kind of look at it. We'll end up using this training to fight each other less than 15 years later. Obvious thing, it expanded the country. Okay, we get the Mexican session um, there. And then another effect would be California because we get California in 1848. And what else happens in 1848 in California? Okay, we find gold. I'll come back to the other slide in there. 1848, a guy by the name of James Marshall. You don't really need to know his name on there. He finds gold at Sutter's Mill. They try to keep it real quiet. Now, when you all have really good news, is it easy to keep quiet about it? Yeah. Now, he came to, and, and Johann Sutter was the person that owned the property, and James Marshall told him, look, here's what I found. And they realized this is gold. There's probably more of it. So what they started doing is going around and trying to buy up all the property around that area, which some people were kind of wondering, when, let's say if the property was worth Ten dollars an acre. Why you come into them and saying, "Hey, we'll give you fifteen dollars an acre for your farm," which normally most people say, "You're going to give me fifty percent more than before." Yeah, I'll take. It. Other people say, "Wait, wait, something's going on." And like anything, what happens if you tell just one or two people something good? They spread. Yeah, it spreads. So suddenly, then these rumors get out. The thing was about these rumors wasn't just in California that they spread too quickly. They spread to the East Coast. They spread to Europe. And in the next year, those stories, and of course the stories got better and better. Some of you have played like a, uh, a telephone game where you tell something and some of you, when you've played that, and you pass a message along, you, you change it on purpose. All right, just see how funny it'll be after it gets to the end. But this is where the stories get. I mean, the stories were that, oh, all you do is just walk around in water, pick up pieces of gold, and you're rich. You know, it's that easy. Just change the gold. But... For a lot of people, and this is, you kind of can fit this into the American dream, because as many of these 49ers, okay, in 1849, when thousands of people came, um, um, they, they came to get their, their fortune uh, there. 
that a lot of it, you were just, I mean, think, you're working in a factory up north. You got had a really bad day, you're sick of your boss. Huh? You don't have really anything to lose. Why not? Take a trip. Well, just a little four, four or five month walk across, across the United States. Get to California and you're your own boss. You can be rich. Okay, you're a farmer. Okay, things have been going bad. All right, pack up and go. Now, did very many people get real rich? Mm -hmm. One guy did. And this is where, for some of you, if you're a lot smarter than me, the way you make money is when everybody's going down this one road, you figure out what the road is and you find something that they need on that road. All right, Bill Gates doesn't make didn't make computers with Microsoft. He figured out, let me make it easier for people to use. Don't have to read and write, you just point and click. Well, John D. Rockefeller, okay, richest man in the history of the United States. What he did is figured out, well, there's, it's, there's a lot of risk in finding oil, but all the oil has to go through refineries. So he controlled at one time over 90% of the refineries in the United States. Okay. Can you make a little bit of money of every time that a person is pumping gas, putting tar, using plastic, not to mention a whole bunch of other things we make from refineries? That's what Donnie, that's how Donnie Rockwell got rich. And then there's a guy, Levi Strauss, and what are Levi's known for today? Yes. Jeans. He went, though, and he didn't go to make jeans. Anybody know what Strauss actually went to California to make? Not tools. Uh, Tents. Okay. Um, and when he went, went to make tents, some of the friends that he went with were looking things and they were having a problem because their normal pants when they were working coming in and out of water. And what you, when you're getting rocks and you see something that might have like something gold in it, you don't know for sure, they put it in their pocket. You have tools you might be putting in your pocket. Again, wet, dry, wet, dry. They tear up. So they went to him and they said, the material he's making these tents, and that's how he's going to sell. Hey, can you just make me some dungarees? Make me some pants. And he did. And there's some things that you have. I happen to be wearing since a Friday. Why do we have rivets on our jeans? Scratch your phone. Scratch your phone. But um, the pop thing. Like the button to hold the tool on. No? Wasn't that? Hold it back together. Is this going to hold more than just a regular sewing? Yeah. So when I put rocks and tools in my pockets, and they were usually a lot looser pants, that would hold the pockets in place more than just sewing. That's why you have ribbons. Okay. Uh, so I said there's, I mean, it, well, and for the longest time for jeans, it was not a fashion statement. As I look around, over half of you have blue jeans on. All right. It wasn't it. It wasn't a fashion statement. It used to be actually, if you would go, if you were to go a hundred years ago, the only people wearing jeans were the people that were having to work outside and do jobs that most other people didn't want to do. Right. You also think at that time, did you want to go and get tan? Because no. what? What does it mean if you're getting tan? You're poor. Yeah, you're poor. You have to work outside. <laughs> hey, the the paler you were. Okay, it showed that you're inside. I mean, it's still in China. That is a major fashion statement still in China. Um, all right, but that is what, um, speaking of China, we would have a lot of Chinese immigrants that, that would come. And this would also play into some things later on because a lot of the Chinese, they would set up different shops. A lot of them made a lot of money um, there, not always in mining. But it also would show the discrimination. We would set up a tax on just Chinese. If they, if they discovered gold, they actually got taxed higher than Americans did. This was before we'd have the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment says you can't make a certain thing on a certain group of people. All right, But we would actually have that. And discrimination on Chinese, which will come up later on in history, would really start at that time in California. Um, notice the population of San Francisco. It goes from 1,000 to 35,000 to 35, people in two years. People were getting there. They also had a whole bunch of abandoned ships. Because as crews came to came to California, they they would end up saying, I'm not gonna work on the ship anymore. They would just leave the ship and they didn't have a crew to sell the ship back. Uh, our last section we had with the Clayton Bowler, Bowler um, Treaty. One of the reasons why we wanted to make a, a um, canal across the Isthmus of Central America was to save time. Because what you would do otherwise to save time and not have to go all the way around South America is 
you would land on the coast of Nicaragua or Costa Rica, and then you would cross by foot to the Pacific where ships would pick you up. And you would hope that you have a good guide to take you across that area, otherwise they're not going to survive. All right, going up to the other side. 1853, we would purchase this tiny little strip of land from Mexico, the Gatson Purchase. Why so much? Why, yeah, why do we pay $10 million for that little strip of land? What's so important about that little strip of land? Yeah. The area to, to go. We didn't like the Gila River on the border? There's no gold. There's no gold. Well, it's around the boundary of Mexico or whatever. What's around? It's not like a direct access. We don't have direct access here. What's the lake? Mountains. Yeah, mountains. Because guess what we're planning to do in 1853? Yes, we want the choo-choo train to have to go through. We want to find a Continental Railroad because 1853, after we had found the gold, we want to connect California with the other area. So, but we have the mountain range. Well, there's a pass that goes through here. So we figured the easiest way to build the railroad would be through that pass, and we basically go down underneath the mountains, go through that pass. But our first Transcontinental Railroad actually ended up being up here. Why? And here's where when we say why, and I have what would later change the route into a more northern route. Gadsden purchased in 1853. Going back to your bracketing dates, what major thing happened in 1854 besides the formation of the Republican Party? Yeah, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which at that time, we're going to have a guy by the name of Stephen Douglas that changes it where instead of it going here, it moves northern for the first one. And we do go through the mountains. I don't remember so the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Well, we, that's where we haven't, actually haven't even got to it yet. But this is where, this is where even when I told you we're bracketing dates, that it's a major changing in history that you probably have never heard of. All right, well, you already see it here's something. Here's a change in history. We go from first row up here, which took a lot longer than 1869 is when we finally built the first trans transcontinental railroad. We're planning on it in 1853, and it takes us 16 years before we get it there. All right, uh, see what we done? Okay, told you. Go ahead, you can go ahead and turn the camera off now. Yeah.